Um, I was out of town last week. Pastor Dan did a fantastic job as always, but I missed being here and I watched online as many of you are watching online this morning. And if you are, good morning, welcome. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a subject that I hope you're going to find interesting. Um, it's um, a little theological. It is one that is sort of foundational. It's kind of the why behind what it is that we do as Christians. Now, we've talked since January 1 about um, growing in our faith, about transforming, about becoming a different person, about becoming more like Jesus. And there's a reason or a point as to why we do that. And it's not just so that we can have a better life. It's not just so that God will bless us in the things that we're going to try to do. It's much bigger than that. It's because of who God is. And it's because that God is holy. And so I was reading an article and when I was on vacation last week, spending time with Emery and Eden and Richard and Nathan and Leah, and uh, the article sort of captured my attention. And so I spent some time listening to some sermons and studying this passage. It's an Old Testament passage, one that you may have read before, maybe you haven't, and we're gonna have some fun working through it today. Isaiah chapter six, and we're gonna start with verse one, and it's a time or a story about when the prophet Isaiah moved from most likely being a priest to becoming a prophet. And before we start, I'll just tell you in case you don't know, a prophet in the Old Testament was a person who God chose for a period of time and for a specific purpose to communicate what God wanted the people to know. And it's really important, I think, for us to understand that a prophet was just a person like you and me who was chosen by God. The Holy Spirit would come upon someone. And as the Holy Spirit came upon them, not indwelled them like the Holy Spirit does in the New Testament times, that we, um, or that they, would, were able to speak words that God wanted them to speak and to tell the children of Israel what they should know from God and sort of point to who they were going to become and things that were going to happen in the future. All of the prophecies in the Old Testament led toward Jesus. And that's the point. So Isaiah had an encounter in church that was unlike any other encounter that he'd ever had. And I hope you can have an encounter that may be similar to that. And if you can, and you really understand and you lean in, then your life may be different than it ever has been, that you may be changed and you might be surprised at what God will do through you, not just for you because the for you comes only when the through you happens. Did you miss that? I know it's early in the whole teaching time. The for you comes only when the through you is happening. When you allow God to work through you, then things happen for you, but not until. Let's read Isaiah six, beginning in verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their, their feet and with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Are you tracking with this story? Yeah, this is a pretty descriptive, pretty impressive, pretty profound thing that's happening. And this is a real event that really happened in the life of Isaiah. And the whole temple was filled with smoke. Could you imagine seeing it? I can't. I wanna break this down for you. Let's talk about King Uzziah first. I want to give you some characters. We want to lay out the plot points, the important actors. King Uzziah began his reign or his rule at 16 years old. 16 is not old enough to be president. It's not old enough to be in any position of responsibility of life and death, making financial decisions for an entire nation. But the way it worked back in the day was if you were in the right family, in the right place, at the right time, of course, they were assassinated often, so it could be the wrong place at the wrong time. You became king. So he became king at 16. He ruled for 52 years and he started off a pretty good king. 
He started off in a time that was volatile. There were warring tribes all around Jerusalem and, and Israel was divided into the northern and the southern kingdom at this time. And, and so when he came in, he provided some border stability. He provided a, a little bit better economy. The trade um, relationships were firmed up, were solidified. He even fortified Jerusalem to protect them from attack and people liked him. But something happened and the same thing can happen to you and to me if we're not careful. And that is that the things that God was doing through Uzziah, Uzziah began to take credit for, and he got a big head. He got proud. Because no matter how gifted you are, no matter how hard we work, no matter what kind of people that we think we are, whatever we accomplish is God's gift to us. Because God gives intelligence, God puts people and circumstances in our lives. And regardless of how much we think we deserve it, at the end of the day, it's really God's blessing or it's not. We add everything we can and God provides the rest, the important stuff, the through us stuff. So Uzziah started taking credit for it. And when he did, God was displeased. And so God gave him a disease and God gave him leprosy which as you probably know, was a fatal disease. Ultimately it killed Uzziah and the people in Israel, they were stunned. They were freaking out. Unsettled would be an understatement. The king who they'd learned to trust, who brought some stability, some health, good politics and policy was dead. And Isaiah was about to re meet the real king, the true king who would never ever die. So let's move on to the very next um, people or, or, or not people, but creation that, that is a part of this story. And I want to help explain this to you. And maybe you know about this already, but if you don't lean in, because it's very interesting, the seraphim are angels and angels play a, an important part in scripture as God's messengers. But we don't know a lot about angels and we're not told a lot about angels because we're not supposed to know that much about angels we would be tempted to worship them instead of worship God. And so we're only told what we need to know when we need to know it. But the seraphim were angels that were only mentioned in Isaiah six. And just a brief mention like this really shouldn't have brought as much speculation and tradition, but the Jews, when they got bored, they would take things that scripture didn't say, and they would sort of surmise what God might have meant. And they developed this whole theology or ideology of the seraphim into something that exists even today, um, which we don't have any idea if it's true or not. What we know for sure is that they were angels and angels are created beings by God that ultimately and originally Satan was an angel. The Jews believed that Satan was a seraphim, a worship leader that he chose to be like God and was cast from heaven with the angels that chose to go with him becoming demons. We don't know the number, but we do know the decision was permanent. We know that angels, the good angels, serve the Lord, that they are right now higher than us in certain ways, but ultimately won't be that people, when we die, we don't become angels. That would be a bad thing because a person, when we die, if we're in Christ, we become greater than, and I don't mean greater like in a human hierarchy, but we have a better place in our relationship with God than even they will. So if you view angels as little babies, little chubby babies floating around with these little wings, don't view them that way because this is what Isaiah saw. He saw sixth wing creatures. Two wings covering the eyes, because as you know, by studying the Old Testament, anytime a person was around the presence of God, and this, by the way, is an artist rendering. This is not Isaiah drawing this out and putting in the illustrated Bible. That's just an artist rendering of what they may have looked like. Two wings covering the eyes because you couldn't look on the presence of God. Two wings covering the feet because like in Exodus, when Moses was wandering around the desert and all of a sudden the burning bush appeared and God spoke to him through the burning bush. He said, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. 
And so many people think that's the reason the feet were covered. And with two wings, I guess the middle wings, they were flying around the room and they were yelling back and forth, volleying in a thunderous praise, holy, 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 the Lord God is mighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Repetition was an important part of Jewish teaching. It was an important part of my mom's teaching. She would say, Ricky, you better do it. Ricky, you better do it. Ricky, you better do it. And then after the third time, I got the flip flop. Schmack, right on. No, I'm just kidding. Mom's probably watching this and she would deny it. I grew up in South Florida and that's back when you were allowed to whack your kids in the hind end with a flip flop. And my mom was good at it. She wore flip flops. It was a quick draw. She'd go, whoosh, ah, pop, and right there. And it changed my attitude just like that. But she gave me some chances. You know, I always usually got three chances and, and then you can't do that now or you go to jail or something. And I think the statute of limitations has probably run out on my mom. Um, although it's an interesting thought, isn't it? So, so the repetition is, is important. Jesus, when he taught, would say, verily, 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 if you have certain translations of the New Testament. And that meant, amen, amen, amen. The Jewish teachers would say it at the end of their message. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus said it at the beginning. Hey, listen up, what I'm gonna tell you, you need to hear. So it's not uncommon to repeat. As a matter of fact, my daughter-in-law is very good at repetition. And um, we were there visiting them for the last 10 days or up until last Wednesday for 10 days, as I mentioned. And uh, I've got great kids. I love my kids. I love my daughter-in-law, best daughter-in-law I could ever imagine. And um, you know, if I had a daughter, I would want it to be her. Um, she knows me, she knows me well, and she knows that I would die for Emory, that I'd do anything to protect her, but she also knows that I don't always pay the attention that I should, and that a two and a half year old is already smarter than me. And so she um, was leaving for work. She had a repairman who came over to repair the air conditioner in the backyard. And um, she was going and the repairman said, I have the crawl space to the house open. There's some wires that are exposed. I need to go back to my shop real quick. Don't let anybody, dogs or kids in the backyard. And so Eden, my daughter-in-law, trusted me to make sure that the dogs and the kid, Emery, didn't go into the backyard, but she needed to tell me and she needed to remind me. Now, I'm not mad about it. I would have done the same thing, but look at how she chose to do this. Sticky notes on the sliding glass door. So here's Emery, my granddaughter, trying to get outside. And I, 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 I would, I would be on the phone. I'd walk over, let the dogs out, let Emery out, right? They come back in, the dogs, Emery come back in. I did it all the time. So she put these sticky notes on the glass to remind me, and she was repetitious. She says, do not open, exclamation point. Oh, do not open. Okay, there's, there's probably another one. She said, do not let Emery or the dogs out, exclamation point, exclamation point. And then there's another one. Do not let Emery or the dogs out, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, three exclamation points. And I think there may even be some more. And then she says, seriously, don't let them out. Just friendly reminders. And then I'll, this is my favorite, love you guys. <laughs> and I couldn't even be upset because I'm like, oh, she loves me, <laughs> right? And that's what was happening in Isaiah Six, the angels were repeating, holy, 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 holy. I love you guys. And it was powerful and it was important, significant. Can you imagine what this would have been like? Volleying back and forth over the throne, the foundation of the temple shaking to its core. Smoke filling the room, unbelievable. Well, let's move on. There are more actors to come. Next, we have Isaiah. Isaiah was the prophet. He was a prophet who served God and he, his uh, service to God was during the reign of four different kings. Now, this was the beginning of him as he transitioned from a preacher, from a priest to a prophet. This experience with God changed everything in his life. And he was a prophet for about 50 to 55 years. We don't know exactly. We don't even know how he died. Jewish tradition says that at the end of his 55 years or so of being a prophet, he was running from one of the king's sons who he had prophesied against, that he hid inside a hollow tree and that they sawed the tree and Isaiah in half with a wooden saw. We don't know. 
There's not a lot we do know about Isaiah. He seemed to be a private person. He was where he needed to be, when he needed to be, but he did not believe his own press. He wasn't proud. In fact, for a two-year period of time, he had to wander around with no clothes on, looking like a crazy person, just to make a point. A different time, a different day. But he served the Lord during a time when people had turned their backs on God. And the job that he was asked to do was really important. And remember, the people had seen their king die. And Isaiah had met the king who never dies. All right, finally, in this intro, this is just an intro. This is just setting the stage. Let's look at God, the Lord. He didn't say a word at this point. Can you imagine the scene? And it's something that you would see in a movie, only it really happened. He didn't say anything. Now in John, we learn that likely who Isaiah saw was Jesus. It would have been a Christophany. A Christophany is an incident, an episode, a time when Jesus, who had not yet come to earth as a man and lived for, you know, 33 years, the, the historical Jesus who we study and know about, who he would come to earth and reveal himself in a bodily form to people. And it only happened a couple of times. There were theophanies where God himself revealed himself like the burning bush. But most people believe this was Jesus who had revealed himself. And in this throne room in this temple to Isaiah, and he didn't say a word. And I wonder about this. What expression did he have on his face? And I really think it's important for you to decide. When you picture Jesus, what expression is on his face? Because if you want to know God, we study Jesus. So is he stoic? Is he aloof? Is he distant? Is he removed? Does he look a little angry or displeased? Or is it the kind of expression that's consistent with the Jesus who we have studied for the last several years together? Who has a kindness in his eyes, a smile on his lips, and an outstretched hand. That's the Jesus I picture, but yet the seraphim still yell, holy, 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 back and forth. Not even able to look, covering their feet because it's holy ground. Overwhelmed by the love and the grace and the compassion, but yet the power, because holy is who God is. Holy means set apart or separate. And God is set apart and separate from anyone or anything else because he's God, the creator, the sustainer, omnipotent, all powerful, everywhere, omnipresent, omniscient, knows everything, perfectly and completely holy. And holiness is an attribute, it's a character, it's a trait. And glory is the expression of that holiness. And so we experience God's glory or see his glory, but his holiness is where the glory comes from. And so the glory is the expression of this, this state of being that describes God as perfectly and completely holy. Have you ever driven or walked at night and moved away from the artificial lights at nighttime on a cloudless day or evening, and all of a sudden you see the sky with a gazillion stars up there that are just lit up. And have you ever felt a little overwhelmed, a little small, a little in awe? Well, that's just a tiny descriptor, just a tiny glimpse, just a little piece 
of Jesus' holiness revealed through his glory as evidenced by creation. So God is holy. And if you're holy, you can't sin. And since God is holy and can't sin, he can't sin against us. Which means that we can trust him. Which means that he's the most trustworthy person and it's okay to call God a person. He's not human, but person is the correct way to refer. The most trustworthy person in our lives. And as I was studying this from many different angles and experiencing many different teachers over the last 10 days, I was just overwhelmed with this thought. And I'm thinking about 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 that says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand and you'll see that Isaiah in fact does this that he will lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him. What's it say? Cast some. Cast the things that aren't really that important. Cast the things that might really have caught you by surprise. No. Cast it all on him. Why? Because the Jesus who sits on the throne and is worshiped by the angels who created the world and sustains your life, he cares for you. With a smile on his face, with kindness in his eyes and an outstretched hand, the most trustworthy person we could ever meet. We're gonna come back at the, after we sing and I'm gonna wrap this up and it's so powerful. Isaiah's response, I can't wait to share it with you. How do you view Jesus? Have you ever thought about it? How do you view him? If you were looking face to face, if you were able to look face to face, how do you view him? What's the expression on his face? What's he doing with his hands? What's he doing with his mouth? Is there a smile on his mouth? Is there kindness in his eyes? Is his hand outstretched? Because it's how you view Jesus that's going to determine how you respond to the same invitation that you receive, the same invitation that Isaiah is going to receive. And we'll come back to it in a second. But the reason that the seraphim were worshiping, I believe, is because there was a smile on Jesus' face, there was kindness in his eyes, and his hand was outstretched. And it was his holiness, the truth that he embodied that manifest in his glory that caused them to recognize that not only was he the real deal, he was the deal. And so they could not help but express it. But what drew people to Jesus? Let's read this together. It gets better and I wanna share it with you. Woe to me, Isaiah cried. I'm ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand that he'd picked up with a pair of tongs I mean, this is sort of blowing me away. I mean, there were just live coals that were just sitting there at the altar. I want to know more. I want to see something to give me some detail. So one of the seraphim picks up one of the live coals with some tongs that I guess he had in his angel pocket and he flies over. And when he touched my mouth, he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven, atoned for, the price has been paid. Then he heard God speak. And the Lord said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Now, 
Isaiah, one of the things I want to point out to you, was not worshiping the Lord with the rest of the, the seraphim. When he experienced the Lord, when he walked into church just like any other day and saw Jesus sitting there on the throne with his robe all across the entire building, seeing the smoke, feeling the shake, he wasn't worshiping along with the rest of the angels. He immediately recognized God's holiness and saw or experienced his glory. And he pronounced a curse on himself. He said, woe to me. He used woe 10 times in the Old Testament as he was writing about God's judgment on other people. And he pronounced a curse on himself. Woe to me, I'm not even worthy to be in this room. Woe to me, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. Woe to me. The old translations say, I'm undone. He didn't join the seraphim because he couldn't. And the thing I want you to recognize is that Isaiah said some things that were very specific. He said, I am a man of unclean lips. Ironically enough, he was a priest, which he would have been communicating the word and that would have been the part of his body that God was gonna use as a prophet. And he didn't immediately point to the people and say, they're undone, they have problems. Forgive them, God. He said, woe is me, I am undone, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. And by the way, the people need you too, but he took responsibility for himself first. And I think that this is ex extremely important because you and I can't be self-righteous if we are comparing ourselves to Jesus. We can only be self-righteous when we compare ourselves to other people. And that's what's been wrong with Christianity in many cases over the last X number of years. Comparing ourselves to Jesus is just too hard. So we emphasize and focus on rules and stipulations, usually things that we're good at that other people aren't good at. And so we emphasize those as spiritually significant, elevate those and judge other people. And the things they may be better at spiritually than us, we don't think are quite as important. And sometimes people get together and form entire denominations or religious structures around these things. And when Isaiah saw Jesus, he said, I can't defend myself. I'm a man of unclean lips, me. Interestingly enough, back to my daughter-in-law, the, the princess of the reminders, the, the repetitious sticky note lever, Eden. She was buying a Bible while we were there this, over this last week, a new Bible. And I think it's kind of cool because I've started using my, my regular paper and leather Bible again. I was doing a funeral yesterday and I texted Pastor Jared and I'm like, hey, I don't need this on the screens. I'm actually gonna read it in my leather and paper Bible. And for me, it was weird because I was having a hard time even finding the, the New Testament books because I'm so used to just punching it into my phone, going Second Thessalonians and it just pops right up. And, and I've started using my, my leather and paper Bible again. If you don't have one, you might wanna buy one, but Eden was buying one with the, the note um, space in the side so she could take notes as she was reading the Bible. And I love that. She goes, hey, what translation do you think I should buy? So we were talking about it. And she orders it. And so I just made this little joking comment to her. And I said, hey, when you get that Bible, give it to me first. And I want to underline some parts in there that you should read. And she looked at me, didn't miss a beat. She goes, sure, as long as you give me yours and let me underline some parts for you to read. <laughs> and of course we laughed, right? All in good fun. But isn't that sort of what we do? We even take scripture and we're like, here, I'm going to underline some parts for you to read. And then you're like, well, I'm only going to do that if, you know, and we just missed the point. And Isaiah said, look, I'm not even worthy to read any of it. Can't do it, can't. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So the angel takes a coal from the throne, which represents the authority of Christ, which foreshadows the cross and the resurrection and touches his lips and says, your sins through Jesus are forgiven. And Isaiah didn't deserve it. And he couldn't even ask for it because he was comparing himself to a holy God and experiencing the manifestation of his glory. And I believe doing all that with a smile 
on his face with kindness in his eyes and a hand outstretched, but still made Isaiah shake to his core. And not only Isaiah, but the angels and the very temple. His sins were forgiven. And when his sins were forgiven, for Isaiah, everything changed. What did he owe God? Well, what do you owe God? Since your sins are forgiven. Everything. Because you were born just like me, sinful. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this story is about Jesus tapping Isaiah on the shoulder, saying, I'm gonna use you to tell them about me, which happens in Isaiah chapter seven, and everything's gonna change, which is exactly what happens next. He follows up this, this forgiveness, this offer of forgiveness with an invitation because God doesn't just give us forgiveness so that we can put Christianity in our pocket and say, well, you know, I got to get out of hell free card. So if I get hit by a truck, I'll just whip that out at the pearly gates and show it to Peter and he'll let me in. He doesn't offer us forgiveness so that we can rub our magic God genie lamp anytime we get in trouble and he pops out and solves our problems. He offers us forgiveness because he has a purpose and a plan for your life and he wants so badly for you to serve him and allow him to work through you so that he can do what he wants to for you as you live your life for him. So then he offers an invitation and this is where you have to decide. He says, um, who shall I send? And who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Now this is important to me. And I just want to say this quickly. I want you to track with me because I think this is very important. Jesus says, and who will go for us? Who will represent us? Who is us? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? God. Who will represent me well? And the way you represent is 100% dependent on the way you visualize. Because if you visualize an angry Jesus with anger in his eyes, with a snarl on his lips and a fist, then that's the way you're gonna represent him to the world. And I don't think he needs any more people representing him that way. But if you picture Jesus with a smile on his face, with kindness in his eyes and an outstretched hand, but standing for the truth in a way that's unmistakable and living for God's glory, that's the kind of person who God wants to send. And Isaiah had an experience. And he said, here I am, send me. Now, what he didn't say is, here I am, send me if it's convenient. Here I am, send me if I don't have other plans. Here I am, send me if it's easy and doesn't cost me anything. He said, here I am, God. Send me wherever you want, to whomever you want. I'll do whatever it takes for as long as it takes, even if I'm hiding in a tree and I'm sawed in half, <laughs> if that's what happened to him. But yet we play games. Christians, we Christians often play superficial, silly churchy games with God, almost like a hide and seek. I'll serve when I want, I'll do what I want, as long as it's good for me. And if it's not, I'm out. We compromise our faith, we disobey whenever we feel like it. And we do it in the face of a holy God. And I think that if we had an experience like Isaiah, I don't think we'd play games with God anymore, do you? That's the reason that we love. It's the reason we grow. It's the reason we're here. 
It's the why, the why we do what we do. Because I believe that we were created to worship God and to glorify him forever. And I want us as individuals and as a church to continue to say, here we are. We'll do what you want. Here we are. Send me. Not send them. Send me. And that's the beginning of it all. So what do you do? Just keep coming. That's what we're talking about. It's what I'm teaching on. It's what the word of God continues to point back to over and over again. Lean in and apply yourself because our church exists to glorify God, to reach out to our community with a smile on our face, with kindness in our eyes and an outstretched hand, but a commitment to the truth that's unmistakable and shows through the cracks of every interaction. And God will glorify that. He'll honor that because it glorifies him. So do you want to experience God? I know I do. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And this powerful example of how Isaiah was tapped by you to be a prophet, to speak. None of us are going to be prophets. You've given the Holy Spirit to indwell us and scripture to inform us. But you have a plan for all of us, for each of us, for us collectively as a church. We don't know entirely what that is, but in some ways we don't really, well, it's above our pay grade. So my prayer today is, Father, that we will answer you just like Isaiah did. Simply, comprehensively, genuinely, here I am, send me. Because you are God. You deserve it. It's the reason we were created and it's the least that we could do. Thank you for my friends, Father, and I love them. And I thank you so much that we are growing together. That with every Sunday that we meet, and everything that happens in between, we're becoming more and more of a family. And we want nothing more than to represent you well so that people can meet Jesus and their lives can be changed. So that's my prayer, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay with